So, we are done with the prologue. John chapter 19, we're starting today. Uh, and we're talking about, um, yeah, I know, because we were in the prologue for so long. Like, woo! Uh, <laughs> we are, um, we're talking about uh, being used by God today. And the reality is, is that everyone in the world is used by God. Uh, the reality is that some people are used by God um, by choice in their faithfulness. And other people are used by God in their rebellion. See, everyone that lives is, is used by God to accomplish his purposes. Uh, what I kind of want to talk about today as we read um, the, the story of John the Baptist, uh, we've skipped him now a couple times in the prologue because I said, we're going to get to him, we're going to get to him. Well, now we're getting to him. Um, is we're going to see an example of what it means to be used by God in a positive way. Uh, all kinds of examples in the Old Testament, like Pharaoh, who's used by God despite his disobedience, despite his rebellion, despite not wanting to be a part of what God's doing in the world. And God uses him anyways to let the people out of Egypt, okay? But we don't want to be like him. That's not the goal. The goal is to be used by God because of our faithfulness, because of our um, love for him because we want to be a part of what he's doing. So we're going to look at John the Baptist this morning uh, as a picture of that and try and figure out what is it that we need to understand in order to be used by God in a positive way, in order to be used by God in a way that's going to benefit us and not just be in spite of what God's trying to do um, in the world around us. So this is John chapter 1, verse 19. Now, before we kind of jump in here, um, this is going to be a little bit of a a weird thing for the gospel. We finish the prologue, and then all of a sudden we jump straight to the life of Jesus. Um, here's probably why John does that in his gospel. Most likely, John has Mark's gospel when he writes his gospel. Most likely, John has Matthew's gospel when he writes his gospel. Maybe John has Luke's gospel. Maybe. We don't know. So he's probably reading Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel and saying to himself, we don't need to rehash out the birth stories. We don't need to rehash out the, prophesy, the prophecies about the Messiah. The other gospel writers, they took care of it. They confirmed it. They're the same. The stories are the same. We don't even really need to go there. John seems to be more concerned about the life, actual life of Jesus. So he goes straight from the prologue, straight into Jesus, older Jesus, okay? Starting his ministry, he's about to jump um, into doing the work of God in his own life um, from growing up uh, from a baby. And so John just jumps right into that. And, and he really jumps into that at Jesus' baptism, which we're not going to see this week. We're going to see a little bit later in John chapter 1. But to give you a little bit of background about who's doing the baptizing and who is this guy and what does he say about who Jesus is, he starts off with the story of John the Baptist. So we're jumping into Jesus' life, starting with his baptism, the inauguration, if you will, of his ministry. But before that, we got to talk about John the Baptist, the guy who actually baptizes Jesus. So that's why John starts, I think, with this story of John the Baptist in chapter 1, verse 19, after these introductory things. So start with me. John chapter 1, verse 19. John the Apostle writes this. This is the testimony of John. Remember I said in the past, John the Baptist is not John the Apostle. It's not the one writing the gospel. Two different Johns, same time period. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So here's the scenario. John the Baptist has grown up. Okay, He's similar age as Jesus. And now he's going around dunking people. All right, he's getting him in the river, come to the river, we're going to dunk you. This is a foreign concept to the Jews at this day. They have no concept of baptism. In Jewish culture, there was what's called mikvahs, carved in the rock, holes in the ground, which would catch rainwater. And then they would go and walk down, there's little steps, they would walk down into the mikvah, and they would dunk themselves, dunk and then they would walk back out. And it was a very personal thing. It was part of the purification rituals. They would go, they would dunk, they were purified, they would go do some other hand-washing rituals, all kinds of stuff. And that would allow them to go then worship at the temple. That was normal custom for the Jews. Mikvah, you dunk yourself. Nobody's dunking someone else. This is foreign concept to them. 
So John the Baptist comes on the scene. He's taking people to the river, baptizing them. And the religious leaders are like, who is this guy? Like, who is this guy, and what is he doing? Like, why is he dunking people? This is supposed to be for purification. This is supposed to be for worship of God. And it's almost as if John the Baptist is saying, I purify you. But what they know is that the only one who has the authority to do that is the Messiah. So they're going to start asking some hefty questions about John the Baptist. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who are you? By what authority are you doing these things? And why are you doing them? And so they're going to, so the chief, so the priests and Levites, they come to him and they're like, who are you? Because if they're the Messiah, if he's the Messiah, they, they need to know about it. So that's why they're asking. He answers this question this way in verse 20. He confessed, John the Baptist, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So in the New Testament, Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Okay, it's a title. It's not Jesus Christ, last name. It's Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Same equivalent to the Old Testament Messiah. So John's clearly saying here, I am not the Christ. If you're wondering if I'm the Messiah, it's not me. Now, okay, here, let me take a side note for a second. This is going to be kind of off topic, but I I promise we'll get back there in about 30 seconds. I read an article the other day that said... um, that said that millennials are skeptics. Skepticism encompasses millennials. And then I was reading this verse the other day, and I was like, wait a minute. Verse 20 doesn't make any sense at all. This is ridiculous. How could this be? And then I stopped, and I was like, yeah, I'm a good millennial because I'm a skeptic. I question everything. I don't understand what things say. And then I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. The Bible's wrong. And then I do a little more research. And here's what I found. If you read verse 20 in the English, it makes no sense at all. Read it with me again. He confessed, he says that twice, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So if you split that up like you normally would in in English, he confessed, I am not the Christ. Okay, that's great. That makes sense. And he did not deny that I am not the Christ. And I'm like, it's a double negative, which means he's saying he is the Christ. So is he the Christ or is he not the Christ? In the English, this doesn't make any sense at all. And I'm like, what? How could he be the Christ? How could he confess he's not the Christ and not deny that he's not the Christ at the same time? I don't know. Just maybe it, maybe it made sense to you when you read it, but it didn't make any sense to me. Luckily, uh, when the English fails to express what the original language is trying to, we have the Greek. And so it makes perfect sense. That verb to deny actually means to not know or to not be a part of. So in other words, here's what John the Baptist is saying in verse 20. I am confessing to you that I am not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I am not the Christ. (laughs) But I'm not saying I don't know who he is. And I'm not saying that I'm not a part of what he's doing. But I'm not him. But he's denying not knowing him. (laughs) Make sense? A little bit weird in the English, not so weird in the Greek. So first answer to the question that he gives, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. Now, if you read carefully to the questions that they're going to follow up, ask him, uh, the priests and the the Levites are basically going to ask him the same question two more times. And he's going to give them the same response in different ways. And I'll show you why. Next question they asked him, They asked him then, verse 21, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Now, on the surface, you might think that's a very different question. I mean, Elijah is obviously not the Messiah, but the Jews actually thought that Elijah was the Messiah, or that some Jews thought that he might be the Messiah. Curiously, in in, uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Malachi says this, prophecy about the future. Behold, I will send you, speaking through God, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so many Jews read that in Malachi, and they were like, the one who is to come, the Messiah, must be Elijah from the Old Testament. The actual Elijah who was taken up, who didn't die, who was taken up into heaven, he's going to return. He's going to be the Messiah. And then the day of the Lord, judgment. And so there were a lot of Jews that thought, 
the Messiah is going to be Elijah. So these priests and these Levites, they are smart. They're like, okay, okay, you're not the Messiah, but are you Elijah? Same question. Same question, and he answers the same way. No, I'm not. Then they ask him a different way. They say, are you a prophet? And he answered, no. Listen, same question. Reason why? The Jews thought the Messiah was also going to be a prophet. The Jews thought the Messiah was going to be Elijah, who also happened to be a prophet. But they get it from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. This is Moses speaking. And he says this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, and it is to him you shall listen. And they took this prophecy from Moses, and they said, The Messiah is going to also be a prophet. And so when the Levites and the priests come asking John the Baptist, he's like, listen, I know what you're here for. I know what you're asking. I'm not the Messiah. And they're like, okay, 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 but are you Elijah? (laughs) He's like, no. Okay, 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 but are you a prophet? He's like, no. Don't you get it? Like, I'm not who you think I am. And this is baffling to them because he's baptizing people and it doesn't make any sense. How can he have the authority to baptize people? How can he have the authority to do any of this stuff if he's not the prophet, if he's not Elijah, and he's not the Messiah. And that's kind of where they're going to go next. Verse 23. Oh, no, end of verse 22. He says this. So they said to him, then who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. And they say, fine, if you're not any of these things, who do you say that you are? And then John gives them the answer, which is fascinating because it's straight out of the Old Testament. He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, here's the reason why he gave this kind of abstract Old testament quote answer that's not real clear unless you know what your Old Testament is. Because in verse 24, it says, now they had been sent by the Pharisees. So here's what John knows. John knows that the Levites and the priests who were sent to ask him if he's the Messiah are going to go back and they're going to say, no, he said he's not the Messiah. And the Pharisees are going to say, well, who was he? Who did he say that he was? And the priests and the Levites are going to say, he said that he was the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And the Pharisees should know exactly what that means. Because they're the religious people of the day. They're the ones who are supposed to have the Old Testament memorized. They should have no trouble understanding what that means. And so John feels comfortable obviously giving them this very biblical kind of answer. Here's what you need to know about the quotation from the Old Testament. It's from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. We won't go back and read it because it's Isaiah and it's hard and it's got a lot of mess and it's poetry and it's all over the map and we could spend forever talking about it. Here's what you need to know about Isaiah chapter 40 and the prophet who prophesies that in that chapter. There's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. It's long. And a a lot of the chapters are about destruction and death and the judgment of God and the rebellious people. Majority of the book, until you get to verse 40, verse 40, chapter 40. In chapter 40, there's a major shift in the book in Isaiah. There's a whole lot of judgment, a whole lot of wrath, and then there's just these tiny little verses throughout Isaiah that talk about salvation or the restoration of the people. A verse here, a verse there, two verses here before you get to chapter 40. But once you hit chapter 40, there's this major shift from judgment and destruction to salvation and hope. There's this shift from the people of God are rebellious and God is angry with them and he's going to exile them and he's going to scatter them and destroy their land and all this stuff. And then you get to chapter 40 and all of a sudden God through the prophet Isaiah starts talking about salvation and restoration and bringing the people back to the land and restoring them. And so when they ask John the Baptist, who are you? John the Baptist says quite clearly, I'm the voice of the one who's making the transition from destruction and death and pain to life and hope and salvation. I'm the one coming to introduce you to this transition. The one who's coming to bring salvation, to bring love, the Messiah, he's coming. He's the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. 
Return to the Lord because the Messiah is coming. It's very clear what he says to them. (laughs) But they're still kind of stuck on the same sort of problem that they came with. If you're not Elijah and you're not a prophet and you're not the Messiah, how can you baptize people? Because dunking people takes on the significance of purification, of making people holy or pure to approach the throne of God. How could you decide that for people without that authority? It's the question that they're going to ask him next, verse 25. Notice we're covering 10 verses today. Yes. Woo. Okay, verse 25. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor a prophet? By whose authority are you doing this? And what are you actually doing? Well, why are you baptizing people? So John, in his response, is going to tell them what he's actually doing instead of what they think he's doing. They think that he's taking people down into the river and baptizing them and declaring them pure and holy and righteous. That is not what John's doing. Although they think that's what he's doing because that looks like what he's doing. Because all they've never known is going down into the mikvah and baptize yourself. Now you're pure. You can go worship at the temple. That's all they've ever known. So it looks a whole lot like John the Baptist is declaring righteous. Next, righteous. Like, so he's going to explain to them what he's actually doing. And then he's going to explain to them why he has the authority, why he is worthy to do this. It's verse 26. This is what I want to, this is the picture that I want you guys to see of who John the Baptist is and maybe who we can reflect. John answered this. John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. In other words, what he's saying is, all I'm doing is dunking people, not saving anyone. I'm not purifying anyone. There's nothing happening by what I'm doing. You all think that I'm declaring people righteous. I'm not. I'm just dunking people in the water. I'm preparing them for the one who is to come, whom baptism is the symbol of, I'm going to put you down in the water and I'm going to bring you up washed clean. The water doesn't do that. I'm just dunking people in the water. But there is one who's coming after you who stands among you who you don't know, who will do that for you on the inside, not just on the outside. I'm just baptizing with water. You'll see that a little bit more when later on, when we get to more declarations from John about who Jesus is down in verse 33, but we won't get there today. In other words, he's simply saying, I'm not doing what you think I'm doing. I'm not purifying people. I'm not declaring them righteous. The water doesn't do anything. I'm just baptizing them so that they know what it's like to be renewed when the, when the Messiah comes and does this for them from the inside out. And then he makes this curious statement in verse 27. Second half of verse 26, he says, but among you stands one you do not know. In verse 27, even he who comes after me the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. And this, this I think, is the key to being used by God in a positive way. It's it's understanding that in comparison, by nature, us to Jesus, us to God, that we are simply not worthy. And you say, well, how, how does that get us to being actually used by God? Well, We can walk around with all kinds of pride, with all kinds of entitlement, with all kinds of belief that because we have a certain degree or because we're a little bit older than the person sitting next to us, that that somehow makes us worthy. John the Baptist had this task that no one else in the world had. No one else beginning before or after had the task of introducing the Messiah this just, this just massive part of the church and the history of God working out his salvation plan. Nobody else can do anything like that. And yet he makes this statement. 
Among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, this strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So they're asking him, by what authority? What, what gives you the worthiness to be able to do this job, baptizing people, introducing the Messiah? How, how, do, you, how do you understand that? And what he's saying to them is, the reason why I'm able to do this is because I know who's worthy and who's not. And it's not me. The one who is really worthy, he's coming. But it's not me. Everything about John the Baptist's ministry is, I'm not the Messiah, I'm not the Christ, don't look at me, I'm not the worthy one. And I think if we really honestly want to be used by God, the way John the Baptist was used by God, a, a standalone position that no one else can do, we have to first get this, that he's the worthy one and we're not. To sit for a minute in the fact that we don't deserve good things because of the choices we made in our life. That it doesn't matter how many degrees we have or how high of degrees we have. That doesn't make us worthy to be used by God. The only thing that characterizes our worthiness is being in him and him declaring us worthy. And so there's this balance. I've talked about this in multiple different areas of life, and I'll keep saying it again and again. I think the Christian life is more about balance than anything else. It's about balancing. We're unworthy by comparison. Me standing here saying to God, God, use me. He's saying, use what? And yet, he still uses us. <laughs> Not because we're worthy, but he uses the people who understand that I can be used by God not because I'm worthy, but because he chooses to use me. And so you balance both. Not sitting here being depressed, oh, I'm so unworthy, I'm such a worthless sinner, I can't do anything right, it's terrible, life is horrible. But also not being here, of course God could use me. Like, why would God not want to use me? Like, he should use me some more, and he should give me a platform, and I should speak because I got something to say. Sitting somewhere in the middle of, you're right, I'm absolutely not worthy. And yet at the same time, God makes us worthy, and he can still use us. So I'm, so I'm prepping this sermon this last week. My wife's up at women's camp. Uh, and so she left the baby with me. And uh, so I'm working on this, working on this last night. I'm working through it. I'm working through it. And um, I'm holding my baby. And, and I'm thinking to myself, what makes you worthy to be a father to this child? What, what, what makes you worthy to be the image of the father to the son that God is to the son? What, 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 what makes you worthy to display that to this baby? And yet still, I have this baby sitting here looking at me, wondering, are you going to give me a good picture of God the Father or a bad one. What what makes what makes a husband worthy to image Christ to his wife? Well, what makes you worthy to do that? And yet God calls us to do that. To love your wife as Christ Love the church. No man stands worthy to do that. And yet we still have to. Hus wives, what, what, what makes you worthy to image the Holy Spirit, the helper of God? What makes you worthy to image that to your husband? That's the picture that Scripture gives, wives. 
And it's also the picture that Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to all men and women. What, what, what makes a wife worthy to take up that mantle and say, I'm going to be the helper that God wanted you to have? It, there's nothing that makes us that worthy. Or even just a friend, if you're not married or you don't have kids, but you have friends. What makes you worthy to be the good Samaritan to your friend? There's some balance that John the Baptist understands here. I am absolutely here to baptize people, to bring people back to the Lord. Here's the description of what John the Baptist was supposed to be doing with his life. This is from Luke chapter 1. There's an angel that came to the father of John the Baptist and told him what John was supposed to do with his life. And there appeared to him, that is Zechariah, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. This is Luke chapter 1. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son. You shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him, who we later know is the Messiah. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. What, what makes John the Baptist worthy to make people ready and prepared for the coming of the Messiah? Nothing, and he knows it. Among you stands the one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. It's not about having a great position. It's not about having a lot of degrees or influence or being able to articulate. It's about balancing this idea that we are in and of ourselves unworthy, and yet God calls us to a worthy life. Paul says multiple times in the New Testament, live in a manner worthy of God, worthy of the Lord, worthy of the calling you've received. And yet at the same time, we're unworthy. <laughs> the goal is just to hold those two things in balance. Can I be John the Baptist for a minute? John the Baptist came to prepare a people for the coming of the Messiah, the first coming. But he's coming back for his people. And he still wants people to turn to him. He still needs you to come back to him in repentance. And you say, well, I've never been to him. Well, that's great. First time for everything. There is a, there is a Messiah coming. He's returning. He needs your loyalty, your repentance your hope in him. Pray with me. God, thanks so much that you would pick a man like John the Baptist to display the humility in understanding that he's not worthy. God, and the reality is, is if he's not worthy to do the calling that you've called him to do, then we're not either to do anything that you call us to, be a parent or a husband or a wife or a friend. But God, you still call us to do these things to reflect who you are. God, would you help us not to be prideful or arrogant, walking around thinking that we are worthy because, I don't know, we learned a few things or because we experienced a few things. And at the same time, don't let us leave the room believing that we are just worthless and useless. Just help us to realize that we are unworthy in ourselves and yet incredibly worthy in you. God, help us to believe these things today and as we go.